الله يا الله يا الله يا أخي القوم شبيع مارك سكري يا الله يا الله يا الله يا أخي القوم شبيع مارك سكري Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be back in Morocco again. When I was last at a diabetes conference, it was when um, Professor Fatima Marouan was the chairman of the League Marocaine. And I very well remember the huge warmth of the welcome that I got uh, from her and everybody else. So I had no hesitation in accepting uh, Jamal's invitation to be here today. Adele said that there were lots of senior people from IDF here, and he indicated that that was due to the importance of both diabetes and Morocco, um, but I think it also has something to do with the persuasive charms of your president, Jamal Belkadir. He's a very hard man to resist when he invites you to come to his conference. And it is a, a great pleasure indeed to be here. Mm. How does this, uh, does this little thing work? Ça fonctionne pas. Well, perhaps. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, I want to talk today about the health tsunami of the 21st century the growth of diabetes and the huge impact that it's having on every single country of the world. And it's estimated that today there are nearly 400 million people who have diabetes, but frighteningly, nearly half of them have been undiagnosed. And in an audience like this, where there are clinicians and healthcare professionals. You will know only too well that the absence of diagnosis and treatment means that the corrosive complications of diabetes are taking root and can be extremely damaging to the health of that person. And of course, more frighteningly perhaps, we have the estimate that there will be a further 200 million people who will have diabetes by 2035, in 20 years' time. So altogether, that, that means there's practically 600 million people uh, on the planet who will have diabetes. Now that's bad enough, but actually the situation is a great deal worse. Because in addition to the people who have diabetes, there are those who have impaired glucose tolerance, those with pre-diabetes, those at singular risk of developing this uh, disease. And currently there are over 300 million people like that. And by 2035, it's estimated that there will be 471 million. So altogether, we can see that uh, as of today, 700 million people are estimated to have diabetes or be at serious risk of developing it. And in the next 20 years, that figure will rise to over 1 billion, more than one person in eight on the planet will have diabetes. We know that the majority of the new cases will be in the developing world. Of the 200 million increase in people, in numbers of people with diabetes, no less than four-fifths of them will be in the developing nations, the very nations that seek the economic development and prosperity that my country and many others currently enjoy. But worse than that, the majority of the new case of the people with, with diabetes will be people of working age. 
And of course, for somebody of working age who develops diabetes and who perhaps develops the complications, you can understand that the loss of a limb or the loss of sight can have the most dramatically terrible consequences for his or her family. And the costs are absolutely staggeringly high. Um, I find that whenever I talk about billions and millions, people's eyes gla glaze over. So let me describe the global burden of diabetes to you like this. Every three seconds, someone in the world is diagnosed with diabetes. And every six seconds, somebody loses their life to diabetes. And every 20 seconds, someone loses a limb and their mobility is thereby reduced. It is no wonder that the world is now waking up to the devastation of uh, diabetes and the impact that it is going to have not just upon health systems but the economies of countries. When the world agonized over the Ebola cases in West Africa, and I don't for one minute underestimate the significance of that disease, but when the world and the world's health organizations were seized with the importance of Ebola. Diabetes was killing far more people every day than Ebola ever was. But was the world standing up in anger saying, this is not good enough, it has to stop. The costs are huge. The costs of lost production to the countries where people have diabetes are also huge. But there's one figure that never appears in official statistics, and that is the human cost, the burden to the family of the person who has diabetes. In my country, there are social benefits for someone with diabetes. In too many countries, the diagnosis of diabetes means a cycle of poverty and deprivation for that person's family. And how tragic, how tragic indeed that is. Um, I could say something about the figures of diabetes in Morocco, but for the, uh, our hosts here in Morocco, they will be well acquainted with them. But you can see that the impact of this disease is just as great in Morocco as it is uh, in other countries of the world. Uh, with uh, three quarters of a million people undiagnosed, I always say that that is the challenge for health systems and clinicians and family doctors to diagnose the people who are as yet undiagnosed and try to make sure that we start to treat them. And of course the MENA region about which my colleague Adele and also Morsi will talk, but particularly Adele. In the MENA region, diabetes poses a huge challenge. It is the region of the world that contains the highest prevalences, uh, not just in the Gulf, but as you can see in, uh, in, in, in Saudi and, and Morocco also figures, though thankfully at a lower level of prevalence. Um, the figures are, are huge in, in the MENA region, but perhaps the most frightening uh, fact is that these numbers are expected to double within the next 20 years. So both the numbers of people with diabetes and those with IGT at risk of developing diabetes, these numbers will rise uh, enormously over the next 20 years. And we know all too well what is behind this epidemic. The change that's taking place globally, change in every country. The loss of physical activity and the change in diets. And I must say I have been traveling solidly for the last three weeks uh, around the countries of uh, Europe and North Africa. And I understand perfectly now what uh, a lifetime of too little exercise and too much food does. I have managed to put on 
more than two kilos of weight, and it's simply because the only exercise I'm getting is walking in airport terminals, but I have food put in front of me all the time. And I don't want to be disrespectful to the wonderful hosts who have looked after me in 10 different countries. But in every single country, I've been offered far more food than is either good for me um, or, or would be sensible to eat. And I think that that represents the challenge that exists where the culture is to offer food and the, and, and the practice is to eat it. Today we face this terrible problem of diabetes because of less physical activity and more calories being taken in uh, with the development of obesity uh, carrying on uh, to, to diabetes. But of course it's much more complicated than that because changes in society, changes in culture, changes in the kind of fast food that is marketed and the crazy thing that fast food is gram for gram cheaper than the fresh fruit and vegetables which we should all be eating. All these things together uh, create the circumstances where diabetes has taken root uh, and is expanding at the rate that it does. So what in the face of this can IDF as the voice of diabetes, what can it do? Well, let me just tell you something about the, the Federation. Uh, it has 234 members spread across 171 countries, I think, with, with seven uh, regions, of, of which Adel El Sayed is the, is the chairman of the, <clears throat> the MENA region. It's an active uh, federation where many other associations seek to join because they recognize that it is the authentic voice uh, of diabetes and it's greatly influential in global health circles. If you asked me to set out what is the most important challenge facing the Federation today, I believe it is to target its advocacy and campaigning upon decision makers decision makers at global level, at regional level, and at national level. And at national level, that is why it is so important that we have vigorous national associations seeking to influence and work with their governments in order to address the challenges of diabetes. But the story, if you like, perhaps begins with the United Nations resolution in 2006 when Pierre Lefebvre was the president of IDF. Pierre is a man whom I admire enormously because he it was who had the vision to understand that securing uh, a resolution on diabetes at the United Nations would elevate the profile of diabetes globally. That resolution was not easily obtained because Previous resolutions had only related to diseases like tuberculosis, uh, malaria, and HIV. But that resolution was secured by dint of a lot of hard work, including the work which the Ligue Marocaine did uh, to persuade the Moroccan government to support the, the resolution uh, in the United Nations. And I think that when one looks at the history over 10 years of how diabetes has risen, uh, as a, risen in profile as a disease requiring action by governments, it started with that resolution. And that resolution paved the way for a high-level summit in 2011. The summit was enlarged to take in other, uh, other chronic diseases like like cancer, like cardiovascular disease, like lung disease, diseases which have the same risk factors as diabetes and where working together uh, increased our chances of securing success. And at that meeting in 2011, the world's government said we have to address the problem of chronic disease, of which diabetes is the very clear template. And so, Following that, global targets for health and for diabetes were established and a monitoring framework uh, was then developed in 2013. 
I'll say something later perhaps about World Diabetes Day because that's been with us for more years. But the, these historic global targets are very important and they contain a real challenge and an opportunity to us to make a difference as far as diabetes is concerned. The overall target, the, 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 the umbrella target of the global health targets is the reduction of avoidable mortality by 25% by 2025. They talk about it as 25% by 25. And there are within these historic global targets two targets which I think, two individual targets, which I think are, and, and, and that's not all the targets, that's just a selection of them. But there are two which I think are important to us in relation to diabetes. The first is halting the rise in the growth of obesity and diabetes. And the second is ensuring that 80% of the people of the world have access to the essential medicines and technologies. I think the first target of halting the rise in diabetes and obesity is a very challenging target indeed. And as I go to different countries and have the privilege of meeting the policy makers in the country, sometimes it's the minister, sometimes it's officials from the Ministry of Health, and I talk to them about what they are doing by way of preparations to make sure that by 2025 that growth curve of, of new cases of diabetes and obesity is being tackled. You're not going to change this by taking, making some law in 2024. You're only going to be able to achieve that, ch that target if action is taken now, if it's being planned now, and if all the parts of government are coordinated in or are directed to producing this reduction, this halt in the rise of obesity and diabetes. And the other target of access to essential medicines. Well, I come, from, I come from a country where every person is able to access health. Everyone is able to get the care that they need. My daughter with diabetes has always been able to get the care that she needs. So you can understand that when I go to a country where people can't get access to medicine, I feel particularly sorry for these people and it uh, encourages me to say we have to campaign hard to make sure that people do have access to health. You see, I don't regard health as a privilege. I regard health as a human right. It's a human right just as much as the right of freedom is a human right, just as much as uh, uh, the other human rights that we accept uh, exist. So I see health not as a privilege, not as something that rich people are entitled to buy and poor people can't get access. I see it as a human right, and I believe we have to campaign for it as a human right. And um, I do not believe that it's acceptable that any child or any person should die of diabetes because they cannot get access to insulin, because they cannot get access to the care and the treatment that they deserve. And you can understand, ladies and gentlemen, how angry I can get when I go to countries that can find money for space programs and weaponry, weaponry that you can hardly believe but their people cannot get access to the care that they need for their diabetes. What warped priorities. A country that is going to be economically successful is a country that regards health as an investment, not a cost. And a country that understands that health is an investment is a country that will have productivity, will have economic growth, and will raise the living standards of everybody so that they can afford the access to the care that they need. And it may seem to you that I'm something of a revolutionary, and that may sit, uh, sit at odds with my and I am a former politician where I was a member of the centre-right party. Um, but nevertheless, I do understand when I go around the world what an unfair place it is. 
but how governments themselves could change and reorder their priorities and make health the priority for its citizens that they deserve. We're working hard at the moment on the sustainable development goals because these are important. The goals are, are the successor to the Millennium Development Goals and we have been trying very hard with our colleagues to get health right at the center of sustainable development goals because that is where the development funds will be and that is how we really will start to make uh, a change to uh, the health of people and the importance uh, of people uh, being given proper treatment for diabetes. Um, these goals, there's a whole lot of uh, the goals, there's uh, uh, 17 goals and 169 targets, but they cover the whole range of development. Uh, our work has been directed to ensuring that we can get um, appropriate recognition for health, but here is the challenge for us. There is a target on ending malnutrition in all of its forms, but there is no target on addressing overweight and obesity. And yet, and yet, every government has signed up to the global health targets, which should sit side by side with the sustainable development goals, uh, but they don't. And this is just one of the dysfunctions that we find when the United Nations thinking about development produces goals like that, and when thinking about health produces a different set of goals which don't necessarily match. However, we're not going to wait for the, next 20, for the next 10 years to see whether governments actually come up to scratch on, their, on the targets. We are monitoring year by year the work uh, that the governments are doing on these global health targets and we are checking that they themselves are following the monitoring framework. If they are following the monitoring framework, they themselves are reporting publicly on what they are doing. An IDF is working hard through its member associations to produce the Global Diabetes Scorecard. That is a, a booklet that is produced uh, by us every year showing the action that is taken. And as with every advocacy tool, it is there to be used uh, to encourage governments or to shame governments, if you like, but to encourage governments to recognize their responsibility to honor the pledges that they made uh, when they signed up to the global health targets. And we can see uh, here the, in, in terms of the MENA the MENA regions, we have 73% we have which have a national diabetes plan, which is very good, but we have no countries that have yet got an integrated diabetes self-management education program. Uh, all of you as clinicians will know I use a figure 4 and 8,756, and I expect you probably know what these numbers mean. Four hours is the number of hours that a person with diabetes can expect to have with his or her clinician. 8,756 hours is the number of hours that the person is dealing with their diabetes on their own, without the consultant or the nurse available to them, dealing with their diabetes themselves. Unless we provide them with the education needed to cope with self-management, they will not secure the best health outcomes that they need to have to prevent complications developing. And uh, you know, in Morocco, uh, you're in Morocco, so you, you, are, uh, you are making progress, but obviously it's, it's possible to do, to do more. Um, and I welcome the fact that uh, Fatima Marouane is now uh, a minister in the Moroccan government. I wish she was the health minister because she understands perfectly what needs to be done about diabetes. But she's in a position of power and influence within your country's government. And knowing Fatima, I'm sure that she will be encouraging the health minister and other ministers to take this seriously. It's not just a health matter. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of sport. It's a matter of planning the design of cities so that people can be encouraged to walk rather than take public transport. It's a, it's a matter of ensuring that the education system educates children at a young age on the importance of a sensible diet, 
the importance of education and the importance of taking responsibility for their own health. People cannot expect a government to be responsible for their own health. They have to be responsible for their own health. And that is a characteristic of someone with diabetes. In these 8,756 hours of the year in which they can't speak to their clinician, they have to take responsibility for their health to make sure that they optimize their health outcomes. We have a global network of parliamentary champions, and the reason for this is no accident. Um, if you're going to make sure that a government honours the health targets and, and puts diabetes at the centre uh, of their policy, then you have a health, you have a, you have a, a diabetes association like the Ligue Marocaine, which uh, uses advocacy and which speaks about the importance of government action. And ideally, you have a parliament, a person in parliament, or people in parliament who will champion the cause of diabetes in their parliament. That is how I became involved in diabetes myself. After the diagnosis of my daughter, I was a member of parliament, and I stood up in parliament and championed the cause of diabetes. I was the only one, I was the only one in the whole of parliament that was prepared to do so. Why? Because there used to be a lot of stigma about diabetes. People didn't want to admit that they had diabetes. But if your child has diabetes, you simply have to talk about it. And you simply have to make a noise and uh, achieve things. And our parliamentarians, there is a net global network of parliamentary champions. Our parliamentarians in their national parliaments are achieving great things week by week by week. In addition to our parliamentarians, we have young leaders who are uh, young people uh, most of them have type 1 diabetes, young people who are champions of diabetes uh, in their countries uh, before the media speaking about the interests of young people. And they are an immensely vigorous and energizing uh, group of people. And on World Diabetes Day, well, I want to say thank you to the Ligue Marocaine for the work that they do uh, to mark World Diabetes Day. I've been impressed at the range of activities of countries all around the world. And uh, this year, uh, we're going to be concentrating on healthy eating, which fits beautifully, Jamal, with, your, with the, the, the topic of this conference, which is a conference on diabetes and nutrition. We'll be talking about healthy eating. We'll be talking about that, the other half of the walk more, eat less, and what you do eat, make sure it's as healthy as possible. And um, if we were to see a, a, a wholesale improvement in diet in countries, that would do a great deal, a great deal to help us towards that target of halting the growth of obesity and diabetes. And we gather the evidence, and uh, Pierre will know the importance of the Diabetes Atlas that's produced every two years. The seventh edition will be produced in Vancouver and it will have more information than ever. That's an important advocacy tool because that is what persuades governments that they need to start taking action or take more action uh, on diabetes. Then much of our work in, 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 in addressing the challenges goes into programs that we operate in different parts of the world. Here's one called WINGS, which is uh, dealing with women in India who have gestational diabetes. For far too long, gestational diabetes has not figured, has not been given the profile that it deserved. And a woman who has gestational diabetes, that unborn child, risks a life of poor health because his mother did not, or her mother, did not receive the treatment uh, in pregnancy for gestational diabetes. And I'm very pleased that at last it's getting uh, much more attention uh, than it did in the past. And there's also a program called KIDS, which is um, educating children not just about the importance of diet and exercise and so on, but more importantly, explaining what is diabetes 
and trying to overcome the stigma that exists in too many countries. And did you know, for example, in India, that young people will conceal their diabetes, will hide their diabetes, because they fear that it will damage their marriage prospects? Can you imagine the heartache of somebody having to conceal their diabetes because they feel that they will not be able to find a marriage partner? And when their diabetes comes out, they are shunned, shunned by society, shunned by the person that they would like to hopefully marry and settle down to. It is just not acceptable. And we've got to overcome the ignorance and stigma. Stigma comes through people failing to understand the disease of diabetes. And all the, the ignorance then that follows uh, allows people to present this disease in a way that suggests that people with diabetes are somehow imperfect. When I think that people with diabetes can climb Mount Everest and can walk to the South Pole, diabetes needn't stop anyone achieving all that they want to in life. It just means that they have to have, the, have their condition well controlled and then they can achieve just as much as any other citizen. And I hope that the kids program Working with young people with fresh minds that aren't closed with stigma and prejudice, opening up these young minds will help them better to understand uh, about diabetes and make them more sympathetic to the young people they know that have this condition. And uh, finally, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd just like to say, and I'm only giving you a, a, a sample of, of some of the things that are done, IDF operates a humanitarian aid program called Life for a Child. Um, it was going in the days, and, uh, and it was in its very early days when Pierre Lefebvre uh, was the president. And this is a program which provides insulin and strips for children whose families are too poor to buy insulin. I said earlier that it was a blot on the conscience of society that any child should die for lack of insulin, for lack of access to insulin. So Life for a Child aims to help children in, poor, in countries where their parents cannot afford to buy insulin. <coughs> and it's a beautiful program that uh, is supported by caring clinicians like yourselves. Clinicians who run a clinic for these children give them the insulin and strips, uh, take their, do an HbA1c to make sure that the, the child is being looked after properly, and that child comes back uh, each month to get more insulin. Um, that child is supported until it's old enough to have a training or earn its own living. We are literally giving life to these children. And when I visited a clinic in Ahmedabad where there was a session taking place for all these children, when I arrived they were all so excited. It was as though there was a party taking place. They were running around in a state of great excitement and they all gathered around me because we were going to have a photograph. And, <clears throat> and I reflected that each one of these children would be a memory in its parents' mind were it not for this program. That these children would have died had it not been for a program that supports them. So you can imagine how humbled I felt when one of the parents came up and gave me a small posy of flowers and said, thank you for giving our children life. Yes, that's exactly what we've given them. We've given them life. Without that program, these children would not have survived. And yet in that country, you see staggering wealth. You see a £50 billion space program. But you don't see a program to give children insulin as of right. The day I hope will come, while I'm still alive, that every government in the world will have made it a priority to give insulin to its citizens, particularly its children. But until that day comes, we've got to deal with the world the way it is. And in this grossly unfair world, where so many have and so many do not,
then there is a need for that program. And it's a significant financial commitment to say to a child, or to the family of a child aged five, we'll continue to support your child uh, until it's uh, an adult and grown up. You cannot start a program and then say, when the child reaches the age of eight, I'm terribly sorry, we don't have the money for it. So Life for a Child is a program where uh, I'm, uh, as Adele knows, I'm frustrated that we've not made more pro progress um, getting it on a, a more stable footing. Um, but we're looking after, at the moment, over 17,000 children in, in 48 countries, and it makes a real difference. You can understand how I feel when I reflect that my daughter has had all the care that she needed, all the insulin, all the strips, all the expert care that's available, and these children don't have it. I think you'll understand why I have a passion to make sure that we continue to support them through life for a child. And finally, we have a Congress. And I hope that uh, as many as possible of you will be able to come to Vancouver. I also live for the day when we'll be able to stream that conference, that Congress, uh, to all the different parts of the world where people can't come to it. Um, it's a Congress which provides the best in, in the world in terms of uh, clinical practice, research, education, living with diabetes, and I'm grateful to those who both attend and, more importantly, present. Um, I want to finish, Jamal, as I started, in my halting words of French, which I hope perhaps people understood. I wanted to thank people for all they do every day in their clinics for people with diabetes. In IDF, we never take it for granted. We are hugely grateful to you. So I end by saying, shukran, shukran.